Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Today we are discussing Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, once again directed by Steven Spielberg. This is your co-host Corbin. I'm Alan from Chicago. Uh, I'm excited to return this one. It's been a while. It's been a while for me too. I only saw it one time. As Alan and I said a few podcasts back, Alan watched it all the way through many years ago. I forgot the experience. Uh, We were both on a trip. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep uh, probably 20 minutes into it and remembered none of it. Rewatched it for the first time about a year. Well, not really rewatched it. I just watched it for the first time about a year ago and then really sat down to analyze the story this time around. So, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a kind of a newbie to this one. Yeah, I would say that I kind of am cuz I only remember little pieces here and there of events that happened in the movie, but I wouldn't say that I remembered enough to rate it or anything uh because it had been that long and I was just that tired that I just remembered little. So, yeah, so we're kind of newbies. I think you Definitely remember, should remember more than I did uh, before we before coming into this because you watched it more recently than I had. Because yeah, when we watched it together, we were both, you fell asleep. I was almost there. So it, anyways, this is something I've I'm, I'm been really excited to return to. I don't know why I haven't come back to this at all. It's been on Prime for at least six months. So... It did take about three years for them to make a sequel to Temple of Doom, and uh, this one also came out May 24th, 1989, another Memorial Day weekend release, and it was, as far as I could tell, really the only number one uh, movie that weekend, number one opening movie. Nobody would want to go against the juggernaut of... Spielberg, Lucas, Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones. Right. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, you go up against them, you're probably going to bomb. So just be best to just kind of stay away from the release of this for a while. The only other movie that did open that weekend was a movie called Pink Cadillac. I have hmm. no idea what that is. Haven't heard Nobody of it. remembered it. No, it came, out, it came in at number five, not bad. I mean, I guess the only other threat that weekend was Field of Dreams, but that had been out for six weeks, and oh. it still came in at number three. And of course, that weekend, it was number one, $29 million opening, and it did have the widest release yet of Indy, of any Indiana Jones movie. I believe it. This one is written by Jeffrey Boehm, a story by Lucas and Menno Mayes. Uh, it should be noted... George Lucas is always given story credit because he is very influential with coming up with these stories, and we will talk about it the next time around with our, well, as of now, final installment of the retrospective series coming up, The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. He was extremely influential right, with that one. Right. And, and this script with this one too. did go under quite a number of rewrites. Chris Columbus had a big hand in the beginning. He wrote, I think, two drafts and they were both kind of weird. Uh, and basically Spielberg was like, eh, nah, I wasn't, wasn't very impressed by him. Uh, they were kind of strange because they, they, the first draft did was talking about immortality, which is kind of what this one's talking about. But with, with what was called the Garden of Immortal Peaches, uh, that was one of the ideas from the first draft. That's from Chinese mythology, apparently. Um, at one moment in this first draft, Indy fought a ghost. Um, and then Indy dies in the climax, but then is resurrected by the Monkey King, which we talked about being an idea for Temple of Doom. So, Ugh. yeah, it was the first draft was weird. And then yeah, they did do a second draft, and it did deal... Once again with the Monkey King, but it was set in Africa. Uh, I hear that there are act, that I I hear that there were there was a draft that I think it was the second draft actually that, that was leaked online at one point in uh, 1997. I haven't read it, but I'm curious to know what it's about. Apparently, it did leak. So then after that, it moved on to a different writer. I think two writers actually, and then they ended up being I think the ones that kind of created the story. And now what we get to see now 
came from them. So Chris Columbus, he's a pretty big name in Hollywood, but at this point, he worked on like the first two drafts, and then Spielberg put him aside because he's just like, this just isn't working, and moved on to a different writers. So it sounds like the original intent wasn't to return to a Judeo-Christian mythical artifact like in Raiders of the Lost Ark. They were going to continue to go to some other culture or religion. Right. So it, like the la- the first one dealt with Christian, uh, like, like we were just talking about, more Christianity type objects. Like the like that one was the Ark of the Covenant. The second one was set more in India and they dealt with some of their religion. Um, and so this time it looks like they were going for more of a Chinese uh, religion uh, for the main for the main MacGuffin uh, originally, and then they ended up going back. They wanted to, at one point they wanted to more or less go back to the way that Raiders of the Lost Ark was. They wanted to kind of get that same feel as Raiders of the Lost Ark. So then comes in the uh, the Holy Grail. Well, Harrison Ford did come back once again, and there was actually a couple more people coming back this time, unlike the previous installment. This one stars Denholm Elliott, Allison Doody, John Reese davies is back, Julian Glover, River Phoenix. Many of you know Joaquin Phoenix. He is quite famous, and this was his older brother, I believe, who sadly passed away very young. And, of course... Probably the most famous of all, aside from Harrison Ford, Sean Connery, uh, playing Professor Henry Jones, Indiana Jones' father. Right. So, yeah, I mean, they are, from the cast alone, they are kind of going back to what Raiders was. They have Sala is back. Uh, many different characters are returning. Yeah, they, they're going more for that feel of Raiders, which they know was more successful than what they did with Temple of Doom, which we have talked about last week and of course they bring back the nazis once again in this one right it's interesting too because in in uh in the last movie they wanted to stray away from the nazis because they Mm -hmm. didn't want to do a repeat but in this one they of course this one is uh more or less a sequel to raiders of the lost ark so they once again are dealing with the nazis this time which is what they tried to stray away from from uh, temple of doom and of course john williams is back doing the score once again this movie is very, very popular on IMDb. Right. Uh, it holds an 8.3, and it is the, according to IMDb users, the 111th greatest film of all time. Very solid spot. I mentioned, I think, in Raiders, I may mention it in the last one, but I know I mentioned it in Raiders that this, it's usually, if it's not Raiders that's considered the best, then it's Last Crusade that's considered the best uh, Indiana Jones movie that's ever been made. Uh, and we'll talk about that, whether or not that's true. But th- usually these two are the ones that are considered one or the other, more like the Raiders, but those two are usually considered the best. Audiences loved it at the time when it came out. I already said what it, how well it did opening weekend, but audiences, according to Cinema Score, gave it an A, which is pretty darn good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is that is quite good. Like we talked about before in past podcasts, movies tend to fall between the A plus and the B minus ish range, sometimes C. So if it gets an A or A plus, audiences loved it, and I'm yes. I'm sure the money that is being rolled in with this is similar to Raiders, if not more. And of course, the movie did gangbusters comparatively to its budget. Had a forty eight million dollar budget. Of course, budgets keep getting bigger, but. That's just a small price to pay, considering domestically it grossed $197 million, uh, overseas $277 for a worldwide total of $474 million. Yeah, it did really good. <laughs> yeah. This is no surprise. And it actually did quite a bit better than the previous one, and it gets really close to the numbers of the first. And if you adjust for inflation, I believe it is the third. Third highest grossing. Okay. Second or third. Yeah, I'm... So what is the ranking for that? Is it... I'm guessing Raiders is first, and then maybe Crystal Skull, and then this one? Adjusting for inflation, Raiders is the highest grossing, and these are domestic numbers. Domestically, for inflation, mind you, $716 It's a lot of money. Yeah, that's crazy. 
uh, for just an original story. Yeah. Uh, Temple of Doom is actually in second place with 496 million. The Last Crusade, 458 million, and Crystal Skull, 409 million. Gotcha. Okay, so it's basically a staircase just going downwards, at least domestically, with inflation. Yeah, but without inflation, it's it's kind of funny because without inflation, it did better than the second one. With inflation, it did just slightly worse. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Well, the Academy really loved it as well because it was nominated for three Oscars and it did win one of those. And uh, the Oscars were Best Sound Effects Editing. It won for that. The other two were Best Sound and Best Original Score. Yeah, I can see why they got Best Effects. I'm surprised that they didn't get Best Score, though. Uh, yeah. Let me look up what else it was going up against with, with that, because that actually does kind of surprise me that it didn't win Best Score. So Best Original Score for 1990, uh, Little Mermaid won. What? Yeah. Who composed it? This guy, uh, Alan Menken, is his name. Okay, so he's done... Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hunchback of Notre Dame. So he's been involved with basically all the Disney movies from the 90s. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, 1989 had some pretty big hits aside from this one. It had, like I mentioned, Field of Dreams. It also had Rain Man. And I forgot to look up any more beyond those <laughs> two. But those are big ones. So nevertheless. Yep, and... Yep. The, so this was a, from the looks of things, a pretty uh, pretty good year for movies because Field of Dreams and, and Rain Man are both movies that I know have been very influential and very popular even past, uh, even past. I guess it's been twenty years now, almost thirty. Oh yeah, I recently just watched Field of Dreams for the first time. Absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. Comes with my highest recommendation. I it's been a while since I've seen Field of Dreams. I watched it in school in high school. Uh, I forget the reason why, but we had to watch it for something. That's interesting. It was for, Anyways. I think it was for English class for all, of all things. What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, I, I only got to watch the teaser trailer for this one. I thought it was kind of weird behind the scenes peak. It's kind of funny, kind of neat. It said now in production for summer of 1989. And I realized we have gotten these types of teaser trailer first looks with the new Star Wars trilogy, there's always some announcement thing. We're like, oh, it's coming out next year. I didn't yeah. know they had done this before, but clearly they have. I mean, I guess I can see why they do it for this movie, because it is Indiana Jones. But you're right. It does feel it's very similar to what like Star Wars did this. I guess what Star Wars has been doing for the past few years. And with 8, I saw the video where they're like, now filming for episode 8. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I... I yeah. That is interesting, though. I didn't know they did it this far back, back in, way back in 89. Did you get a chance to watch the full-length trailer? I did, yes. Uh, it was... I would consider it to be a good trailer because it's one... It, we're getting to more close... We're getting closer to what modern trailers are today, where it doesn't really... It doesn't have much narration as it used to back in, like, the... I guess it was the 70s to 90s. Uh, it's more or less just a collection of scenes... Uh, that show this is what the movie is going to have inside of it. So in the trailer, we got to we got to see the scene when Indy comes face to face with Hitler, uh, a short scene of Indy riding on the horse chasing the tank, uh, just small things like that. You know, we got to see bits of the pieces of the of the boat chase. It's more or less just showing this is what these this is what's in this movie. It was it didn't really have much of a plot to it. It was more just a collection of scenes and stuff. So yeah, other overall, I consider it to be a good trailer. It does a pretty good job of keeping the tone consistent with what the movie is for the most part. Yeah, it was a fine trailer. So it would get you to buy a ticket then? Sounds like it. Oh yeah. I mean, the, from the scenes that I mentioned, had I not seen this movie before, I would have been very excited to see this. Well, this is the first PG-13 rated Indiana Jones. The previous two were just PG, but I did notice that Nice, neat PG-13 rating right before I watched the movie. You probably didn't get that on yours, though, streaming it. Well, it did. So Amazon Prime usually has the ratings on the rating badge on the, uh, like the I guess it's considered the, the art for it uh, on the page. So, yeah. 
I got. I did see that it was PG thirteen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was a nice big in your face right before the movie started. Oh, right. One of those. Yeah. Well, that listeners- is, I guess we can blame uh, Temple of Doom for this because <laughs> it kind of was controversial last time we or last week that we reviewed that. Yeah, that is exactly why I brought that up because Temple of Doom essentially created it opened up a need for a PG-13 category with a movie that dark and disturbing, you could say. Right. Uh, I don't think this one goes that far, but I still think it probably does necessitate the PG-13. And this is where I would say this is kind of one of the first movies. It's kind of launching that where the PG-13 comes into its own, where it's just, okay, this is automatically going to be a PG-13. PG movies are now relegated, or maybe I shouldn't right. even use that word, to a certain type of film, just to different levels. But that is in our MPAA discussion. You can go check out in the archives. Right. I will have to say, not getting, not jumping into it just yet, but I will have to say that of the th- of the two other Indiana Jones movies that we've watched so far, I think this one is probably the most tame. Of, yes, I would agree of the two. So it is just interesting that the one that is the most tame gets the higher rating, but only because that rating didn't exist when those came out. That is odd. There is a only other one scenario that was weird. I know the all of the Harry Potter series was PG up until I think the fourth one maybe, and that was PG thirteen. But then in the fifth one was PG thirteen. The sixth one was PG actually, and then the seventh was PG thirteen. Kind of odd. Yeah, weird how that just ends up working out. Well, listeners, we are about to get into spoilers with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So if you don't want the movie spoiled for you, go ahead and click pause right now. It is streaming on Amazon Prime Video if you are a subscriber to that, or just rent it or run down to your local video rental store and pick it up, pop it in, watch it, come back to this podcast. When you're done with the movie, hit play so you will be up to speed and we can talk about the movie. Utah, 1912. A group of Boy Scouts are riding their horses through the desert to have a day for exploring. While two young boys are exploring a cave, they stumble upon treasure hunters who have recovered the lost cross of Coronado, a treasure originating with the Spanish conquistador Cortez. In fact, the leader of the treasure hunters appears to be none other than Indiana Jones. But wait, it's not Indiana Jones. The young Boy Scout is Indy played by River Phoenix. Before the treasure hunters know it, Indy has taken the cross from them because, he says, it belongs in a museum. A wild chase ensues across the desert, through an animal-filled circus train car, and finally at Indy's house where his father, played by Sean Connery, won't listen to his cries for help. The sheriff arrives, forcing Indy to give back the cross, claiming the treasure seekers were recovering it for its rightful owner, a man in a white suit with a cane. The leader, known only as Fedora, played by Richard Young, the Indiana lookalike, admires the kid's moxie and actually gives him his iconic hat. 26 years later, in 1938, Indy, reprised by Harrison Ford, finds himself on a ship tossed in a storm off the Portuguese coast, where he successfully takes back the cross of Coronado from the white-suited man after all this time. Back in the States, Indy is teaching his class when he tells them archaeology is about facts, not truth. If you want truth, go to a philosophy class. After class is over, he finds himself bombarded with students and staff due to his long absence, so he decides to sneak out the back window, but is quickly taken by a group of men to the abode of wealthy museum donor Walter Donovan, played by Julian Glover. Knowing Indy can't deny a good artifact hunt, Donovan proposes the penultimate search of all, the Cup of Christ, the Holy Grail. In Donovan's possession is part of a tablet confirming the validity of the legend of three knights of the First Crusade who found the Holy Grail. The first brother made it out of the desert after 150 years of guarding the Grail, but quickly died of old age. The third brother was never heard from again, and the second brother is believed to be buried in Italy, along with the missing piece of the tablet. Indy informs Donovan that the Grail lore was always his father's interest, not his. Donovan replies that Indy's father was helping them and on the verge of finding the lost tomb when he went missing. Feeling a moral obligation to find his father, 
Indy, along with colleague Marcus Brody, reprised by Dan Holm Elliott, set off for Italy. Once they arrive, they meet Dr. Elsa Schneider, played by Allison Duty, who takes them to where she saw Indy's father last in an old library. In the library, they find clues using Indy's father's grail diary, which leads them to a catacomb that houses the sarcophagus of the night and the tablet. But before they can bring the tablet back to the surface, they are forced to flee from the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword, led by Kazim, played by Kevorik Malkian, the secret Christian order who has protected the whereabouts of the Grail for 1,000 years. They do learn some infor- useful information from Kazim, the whereabouts of Indy's father. Henry Jones, Indy's father, is being held on the Austria-Germany border in Brunwald Castle by the notorious Nazis. Indy's attempt to save his father is dashed when he gives up his gun to save Schneider's life. Except, Schneider is actually a double agent for the Nazis, and to make matters worse, Donovan is also working with the Nazis. The Grail Diary, which unlocks the secrets of the three challenges for getting to the Grail, is taken from them by the Nazis. Indy and his father must first escape and then go after it in the Heart of Darkness, Berlin. Once in Berlin, Indy goes undercover to retrieve the diary from Schneider. After they recover the diary, they leave on a zeppelin, but are quickly found out and must escape in the Nazi biplane hanging underneath the zeppelin. Meanwhile, Marcus meets Sala, reprised by John Rhys Davies, at a train station so the two can go help Indy and his father. Except Marcus gets captured by the Nazis. A lot of Nazi capture in this one. Yeah, a lot of the Nazis are kind of all over the place in this movie. Yeah. Indy and Henry eventually make it to the Republic of Haiti, located in northern Syria, where they believe the whereabouts of the Grail to be. On their way to the Grail, Jones and his gang, the Nazis, and the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword engage in a massive battle. The Brotherhood is defeated by the Nazis, but not before Kazim warns Donovan, the cup of life holds everlasting damnation for you. Ultimately, Indy and his crew come out on top, but Donovan and Schneider make it to the secret chamber first, but have no luck getting closer to the Grail. Only when Indy and Henry arrive do they make any progress, because Indy's father is shot by Donovan, thereby motivating Indy to go figure out the three challenges to retrieve the Grail and use its powers to keep his father from death. Indy makes it through all three unscathed, and so do Donovan and Schneider after him. In the final room, they find the last knight, who has been guarding the grail this whole time, because he was found the most courageous. But there is one last unexpected challenge. Choosing the correct grail. Many grails adorn the room. Donovan chooses poorly and is rapidly aged, rotting his flesh and killing him in the process. Indy chooses rightly and takes back the grail to heal his father. But before doing so, is warned by the knight that taking the grail out of the chamber is forbidden. Schneider takes the grail from Indy and ignores the warning and causes the entire chamber to crumble and break apart in a massive earthquake. Through her greed of trying to retrieve the grail dangling on a crevice, she falls into a chasm, meeting her doom. But Indy also finds himself in the same spot, nearly within reach of the grail, or choosing his father, who he just saved. Thankfully, Indy chooses his father, and the two of them, along with Marcus and Sala, ride off into the sunset together as credits roll. So, uh, yeah, Nazis are kind of all over the place in this movie. See, this is set in 38, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. So this is like right before World War II, like really began happening when the U.S. got involved and everything. Um, Yeah, they're kind of all over the place in this movie, but I don't want to focus on that just yet because I do want to focus on something that I found to be very interesting, and that is what's brought up in the very beginning, this... uh, this battle between uh, fact and truth, mm-hmm. yeah, because that's one of the that's one of the first things that uh, is dropped on Indy's plate. Is something that he has to learn over this movie is uh, this the difference and what's better, fact or truth? Because for him, it's the facts. It's it's finding what uh, what has been buried for all these years, what he can see, what he can perceive. So that for him is fact, but what he needs to learn is truth, which is a bit harder to understand from his own perspective. 
Yeah, I did find that to be a fascinating quote. That's why I incorporated that into the plot summary because that really got me thinking about is there a difference between a fact and truth? Because I think there is no, let me rephrase that. No, where should I even start? <laughs> <laughs> this just brings up this kind of honestly confusing conundrum because facts just by their nature are true. But right. then there is truth with a capital T, this objective truth that is not subjective at all. And facts aren't subjective either. I feel like it's very confusing, but I think that is where Indy's kind of, I guess you might even say, moral confusion comes in, where he really doesn't see the overarching, uh, impending, uh, a possible uh, weight of the entire situation. And that's when his father brings it up later, is he's... His dad's like, this isn't just a fun adventure. This isn't just about your kind of self-righteous crusade of being so staunch and uppity about it belongs in a museum. Right. He's saying it's much more important than that. This is a battle of good and evil. I mean, Indy, it's just uh, – I want us to really also get in and talk about characters' character arc, especially Indy and his father because I don't want to tip my hand too early here. I feel like there is one for each of them, but I think they definitely could have fleshed it out better, especially if they're going to just introduce this here towards the beginning about fact versus truth. How does Indy change? I'm really right. interested to know your thoughts on that. Right. So I think – let me start here because this – I think if we, as we've kind of pointed out at this point, it's a – there is – it's kind of hard to even distinguish the two. But I think that what the movie is going for is the fact that nothing is really ever proven, at least not scientifically. So I think that's more or less where Indy's confusion is coming from, is that in his mind, being a professor, uh, he wants to look at the facts, or I guess a professor and an archaeologist. He's looking at the facts. He's looking at the things that is tangible. When it comes to, say, the Holy Grail here, we're supposed to grant eternal life, to him, that's kind of a foreign concept. But his dad is like, this is more than just archaeology at this point. I mean, if we're dealing with something like like this, albeit su a bit more supernatural than what Indiana Jones has done before in Radio of the Lost Ark, for him, it's just like, this is something that could change the tide of the war. For his father, it's what he's been looking for his entire life. And so for Indy, it's not, he doesn't see it that way. So what I'm seeing is more of just the fact that Indy likes to see things that he can hold and he can like, that is that's more physical. His dad is looking at what could be possible at this point. So even though he has everything laid out in this book, which is his diary of every piece of information that he's found about the Grail, they don't have it. And he's just kind of running on faith that it still exists. And so for him, I think that's what is more or less what the movie is going for. His father represents uh, his father represents more of stepping out, taking a leap of faith, because he's spent his entire life on this. Whereas Indiana Jones is just like, I don't, I don't get it. This is, I can't hold this. I don't. We don't have enough proof that this exists or that this is even what it's going to. This even does what it's supposed to do. I think that's more or less what this dichotomy of fact versus truth is going for. I think that's a really good point that you bring up because Indy directly associates facts with archaeology, right. um, bones or pottery or even the whole entire fragments of cities that you can uncover and you can physically date, whereas he associates truth with philosophy. And I thought that's not even right because we know not all philosophy is true because – philosophy different philosophies contradict each other therefore they can't both be right so that right. means that to me that seems to insinuate indy sees truth as more of a superstition it's more of theory it's something that you can just sit around and theorize whereas uh, indy is man of action he's not going to sit around and think about it he's going to go out there and do it and accomplish it and uh that is kind of also this existentialist thought of I, i'm more concerned about the existence of things i can see and not about these hypotheses and uh, yeah indy is definitely a man of action in that way 
and you bring up a good point because his father is more so running off of faith where Indy doesn't really seem to have to share that same faith. It's it's more like, well, give me the tangible thing and then I'll believe you, if that makes right. sense. And that's that's definitely kind of that existentialist humanist, I can self-motivate myself without the necessity for any other truth or higher power. You introduced a really good point with that. Right. So that's what I've, that's more or less what I found to be the most interesting parts of this movie is not just the fact that Indy and his dad have a very good chemistry because they do and it's hilarious, but just this idea of what is fact and what is truth. What is, what are they trying to say with these two things? How are they trying to portray it? I just found it to be very interesting to bring it up in this movie, which is Indiana Jones. It's, I just find it to be this fascinating all around. It is. And I don't want to get to their conclusions just quite yet because there definitely is some things I want to talk about with those conclusions they arrive at there towards the end. But just talking about this opening sequence, I thought it was a blast and I thought it was a really nice switcheroo. Were you fooled that uh, that wasn't Indy? I was a little bit. Uh, at Because f- I remember this very little... I think I remember this part that this is actually Indiana Jones. The kid is Indiana Jones, but I didn't know if that was real, if that was what I actually remembered, or if it was just a- imagination that it created. So uh, it was kind of a uh, switcheroo, but at the same time, I half predicted it just because I, it's been a while since I've seen this. But overall, at, when I first watched this opening scene, I didn't like it. And I was like, because it kind of went against the tone of the rest of the movie. And watching it again, it made a lot more sense. And I understand that everything that happens in this opening will come back later on in the movie. But I still kind of stand by my criticism of it's, it kind of goes more against the rest of the tone because it is just so silly. And it's kind of meant to be that way. I understand it's meant to be that way. But being that the rest of the movie is pretty serious and more adult, it just kind of felt like it was, I felt like it could have been incorporated a bit better. I did find it to work a lot better than the opening of the Temple of Doom because yes. they're very similar with Indy recovering a lost object and escaping through a series of wild events. This is exactly the same way. They both open the same way, but this one is much better. It's handled much better, I would say, with some nice callbacks, and I would definitely say this one is not as cartoonish. Yes, it is more lighthearted, but I think that is because Indy is younger, and I do think it's much more, um, I think it's actually very poignant. You can definitely see uh, aesthetically with the visuals how Indy is jumping through a circus car, which is definitely associated with younger kids. He all seems to take it... um, it's just not as serious as it really is. But then when he's an adult, he's in the middle of a tumultuous rainstorm in the middle of the night. It's very deadly. And both circumstances are him recovering the cross of Coronado. But one is that fun and fancy free kid attitude of swinging from trains and uh, using whips against lions and animals. And then the other one is Instead of uh, more of the animalistic elements, he has to fight the natural elements, which would, I, I don't know. I think that is actually handled very well, I would say. Yeah, that and transition. like I said, I like the the dichotomy between these two moments where we cut between from him being a kid and kind of being playful to when he is an adult and it's a bit more complex and he has, he, he his beliefs have more or less hardened and he's become more he's become more or less ready in to jump into something like this i just found the opening to be much different from what the rest of the movie is going to end up happening i just felt like it could have maybe not because i understand why it's being played with it is such a playful tone i understand why it is here i just would have liked for it to i guess incorporate itself a bit harder and mesh with the rest of the movie a bit better because it just kind of feels like it kind of feels like they took a scene from young Indiana Jones and stuck it on the beginning of this. Um, although it works for the grand scheme of things, it wasn't, it just kind of wasn't nearly, nearly as satisfying as I guess the, uh, at least the first opening was this is definitely better than two. Uh, I'll give it that much, but I just kind of, I guess it kind of left me a little bit empty with its opening, uh, than what I initially had thought it would be. 
So quickly, we do jump into the full plot when he is taken to Walter Donovan's residence and we get quite the data dump, which I've noticed this. It does seem like every Indiana Jones movie so far and uh, sneak peek, I have already watched the fourth one. <laughs> Uh, so I know it operates in pretty much the exact same manner where it seems to be kind of this opening chase sequence and then he's back at the college but then he's quickly jumping into the plot of the movie where he either goes to somebody or somebody comes to him and then they give him this big exposition which introduces him to the rest of the plot and he always has some type of moral obligation at least he feels one to embark on this journey and help the people which is i think a good thing that we do see that uh, moral obligation mixed in there it's not just uh, his overriding desire to be this treasure hunter but it's also this uh, i want to look out for either a group of people or his family Right, yeah, I'm glad that this one doesn't like force Indiana Jones into the uh, situation or doesn't just happen by happenstance because that happened in the last one and we definitely criticized that for doing so. But yeah, I'm glad that this movie does give Indy the choice to go on this adventure and save his dad. We do know, we find out pretty early on um, from Donovan that they had grown apart. We never do get a clear answer as to why that happened. Uh Yes. But I think that it is subtle enough and gives us enough clues to kind of piece it together later on because of their differences in ideals is what I'm what I'm guessing is what happened that and the death of their mother. So I'm glad that he decides, even though his him and his dad are pretty far apart, he decides that I want to go on this adventure and I want to save him. Uh, he, of course, he has no idea what he's in for. And he right. and we, of course, find out much later on, but too late. But yeah, I'm glad that we have he has this choice, unlike the last one where he he had a choice, but he fell into it by accident. Yes. And I guess I'll go ahead and bring it up now because the movie is giving us this moral reason for Indy to embark on the journey to rescue his father. We saw they had kind of this uh, semi rocky relationship when he was younger as a kid. And then when they are on the Zeppelin leaving uh, Germany, there's a scene where Indy, it's like they're going to like finally get their dirty laundry out or finally air their grievances, but right. they don't because Indy's father's like, well, just tell me, like, we need to talk about this. And Indy is like, I, I don't know what to say. Well, then why did he bring it up? Why has he been acting like there's something wrong? And then they're like, okay, well... Well, just be quiet then, and let's get back to finding the grail. Do you know what scene I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do know what you're talking about. I was disappointed with that scene because that could have been a good character-building moment, like good strengthening moment, and I felt like the writer just dropped it, or they're like, okay, let's get back to this. We don't want to hear the mushy stuff, and I'm like, what? don't bring it up and then not follow through with it. Right. I think what that scene was going for, at least from what I was seeing, is... The same with the ideals that they both have, because once again, Indy is more fact-driven and his father is more truth-driven. So I wonder if the reason for why Indy decided to just walk off, maybe there really wasn't a reason in the first place. He just The difference in ideals, ideals for him got to a point where he didn't really see the need to continue his life with his dad. So he went off into his own thing. And then come to, come to happen later on, the ideas that they both have are not as far-fetched as he, initial, as he initially thought. So that's kind of what I'm seeing, but you do bring up a good point. They don't ever at any point hear or never explain why they have broken apart. It's very subtle, uh, and it could be it could be perceived as a criticism. I s can see that, and I kind of go against that. I, I kind of agree with you that uh, it doesn't really give us a great answer for why they are split apart, but I would say that that putting them in a more metaphorical sense it makes a bit more sense to me yeah that's that's a good reading of it as well but talking about the the big heart of the story the holy grail not monty python and the holy grail this is just I was, in my notes i put i'm gonna try and refrain from cracking monty python jokes as hard as i as hard as i can that's funny <laughs> Well, I was following this closely because this is interesting, but as far as I could research and find, this is not 
Christian tradition. This has just mostly been made up for the movie. Uh, right. Clearly, we know Christ drank from a cup at the Last Supper, but the cup was also somebody, somebody we don't know who, took the cup to take to fill up with his blood at the crucifixion. That seems strange to me. Yeah. And then it I, was entrusted I, to Joseph of Arimathea. Okay. Right. Okay. I think, yeah, from what I understand, the blood was not necessarily meant to be taken so literally because when he does dip it in, because they do say that you were to put, when you drink out of it, you're drinking the literal, blood, the literal blood of Christ. And when you dip it in to take a drink of it, it's just a bowl of water. Right. And so my guess is that's what they're going for is that it's more of a representation than it is a literal thing. But yeah, that is a good point. In the Raiders, we had the Ark of the Covenant, which we know exists because of the accounts in the Bible and all the different historical accounts, versus the Holy Grail, which is, as far as we know, not a religious symbol for anything uh, to do with Christianity. But they more or less use that as a tool to go up, more or less walk on faith with this Grail, of course. Yeah, it was fascinating, though, because when we finally do see the Grail and the one he picks, uh, my dad has one just like it. It looks oh. similar, at least, but not exactly the same. But they do make the point like, oh, yeah, this one was made by this would be a carpenter's cup. And right. I doubt Jesus made his own cup that he just carried around with him. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we never I guess we don't ever nobody ever says we he does or doesn't or did or didn't. But yeah. That is that is very true. Uh, it, regardless, I don't mean to nitpick this apart, but it's it's something that's a pretty good thing to latch on to. I mean, the great the Dark of the Covenant is clearly much more of a substantial mystery. This was never really a mystery, but if they're going to pick an object that Jesus interacted with um, at the Last Supper, I'm sure everybody would be like, "What? What? Whatever happened to the cup, Jesus in the?" his 12 apostles drank from this is yeah this is definitely an interesting mystery and we know these three knights uh somehow found it and it became lost but they imparted this tale to a franciscan friar and my one issue with this though is donovan says the tablet is one of the markers proving the knight's story is true and I'm like, how does that prove it's true just because somebody rewrote it down? That doesn't right. mean it's true. It just means somebody else heard the story and wrote it down. Right. Yeah, it, that does kind of get into Donovan's character where uh, he, where he's also kind of confused with this thing of fact and truth. But yeah, uh, that is interesting. I mean, as far as they know, the, the texts that were written down are real accounts for what the Crusaders uh had done and so having fun they said that they, there are two pieces to it and that this is one piece that isn't completely uh isn't completely all there because they're missing a chunk of the tablet but yeah that is an interesting point it just uh kind of feel a little contradictory though because indy is so fact-based yet he takes all of this on just uh, okay yeah it clearly must be true and uh, he just goes along with it a little too easily because I really wasn't buying the whole truth of it, but Indy seems to buy it fairly quickly, and I'm like, well, you gotta really get a leap of faith, and he was skeptical, granted he was skeptical, saying like, oh yeah, I've heard the legend before, and that's usually what he always does in all of these movies, oh yeah, I've, I've heard of the legend, and then he's always proved wrong, it's not a legend, it's actually real, but I guess we should, we're led to understand that searching for the grail is mostly secondary, because it's his father that's gone missing. That is his primary pursuit in going to Italy. And we receive some very interesting instructions from Donovan that he tells Indy don't trust anybody. But for some reason, he doesn't even give Indy a description of who Schneider is. So how's Indy supposed to trust right. this as Schneider? Right. For all we know, maybe that happened off screen. But yeah, that's very true. He never really gives a good description of Dr. Schneider. Uh, Elsa Schneider. Uh, I will. I do want to bring this up real quick. Uh, I think that Donovan's more or less character embodiment is that he's going to take the truth and like more or less poison it for his own doing, 
this is pretty clear the fact that he wants to get the grail and use it with the use it for the nazi regime more or less he's poisoning the truth uh to get what they want more or less i think that's what his whole entire character motivation is for or more representative more representative of yeah he is using it as a weapon to manipulate people into getting ultimately what he wants he seems to be a traitor but ultimately he's just a traitor to himself because he has no allegiance to anybody to any higher power or anything it's all just a selfish pursuit right but once they are in italy they have this fairly simple riddle to solve of 3710 this very much reminded me of the first uncharted game which really rips this off um oh I mean, even seeing gameplay footage, I'm just like, well, that that just looks like they're taking inspiration from Indiana Jones. Yes, there's a puzzle directly dealing with these same room and numerals that you have to solve. And I was like, oh, okay, that's not... Uncharted is not very original as I thought it might have been. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, but once they get down in the catacombs, what's with the Ark of the Covenant on the wall? I felt like that was kind of a needless callback. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just there because this is more of a religious thing. These uh, crusades, these crusaders, or I guess the crusader who's in this tomb, uh, it's more or less of a religious symbol. I don't, yeah, I don't know why it's there other than to bring back the Ark theme. And then Dr. Elza is just like, "Why? what is that? And he goes, Ark of the Covenant. And he goes, do you know that? And he goes, all too well or something like that. And they move on. Yeah, that is... That is very true. There's not much reason for it to really be here, other than, I guess, to foreshadow that it really is the tomb. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I think this whole sequence is fine. I think the real fun sequence that comes is when they have this chase scene from, yes. who are these people? Yes. We have no idea yet, but clearly they don't want them learning any more about the mystery. And uh, it's a great chase. It's really fun. I expect nothing less from Spielberg. Right. And I, I'm going to say this. Uh, two things about really this scene, this boat chase scene, and then later on. I think that this movie has probably some of the best music and some of the best action sequences that we've had. Uh, at least since Raiders and sometimes maybe even topping Raiders. I wouldn't say that no scene tops in this movie, no scene tops the car chase scene in Raiders. But there are some very creative and very fun action scenes in this movie that I would say come close to really anything in Raiders. Uh, this music is fantastic, and these scenes are filmed really, really well with a lot of energy, something that really only Spielberg could do. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with all of that. I will say up until a certain point where I do feel the action just becomes too domineering to the plot, and I do feel the plot takes a backseat to elongated action sequences, but that's towards the very end. Yeah, yeah, and well, of course we'll get to that. But yes, this boat chase scene is very well done. I remember playing this in the Lego game, oh, yeah. this and this and this scene in the library. I remember these playing these these scenes in the, in the Lego game. Mm quite a bit most because of the music that plays during the chase scene uh, having that on loop was just a lot of fun uh i don't know what uh definition just to kind of uh, just sidetrack here barely but i did want to make a comment i felt the blu-ray transfer or even the high def transfer in your case was very well done for this 1989 movie uh very clear image a very nice use of colors and that does also give credit to the lighting people and the cinematographer. I thought it was very well shot. Yeah. I thought from what I could tell on off Amazon it looked very good. Uh I don't I guess I can't judge too much because it is I am streaming it. Uh but yeah, the I could I wouldn't imagine that this movie doesn't look good on the Blu-ray. Uh I thought it was really funny how uh Indy's relationship with women is handled in this one they kind of took a bit of the elongated scene in Temple of Doom where there's this flirtatiousness, but this is uh, very much truncated, but it's the right choice because it's hilarious how uh, she she comes across as mad about something he's done and he says, knock it off, you're not mad. And then she starts right. kissing him and he said, leave me alone, I don't like fast women. And then they yep. start kissing. It's, I, I love this yep. scene. 
And I like how this actually feels a bit more realistic than what it did in the last one. Because the last one, they more or less didn't talk, they didn't really flirt very much up until that one scene when Indy tries to go inside, of, go, in, go in her room. And then things got, then things were picking up for really only that one scene and up until the end. Here, he's been flirting with her ever since they met. And so getting to this scene uh, is more of him just waiting for it to happen, more or less. So yeah, this scene is very funny and feels, at least has more of a lead-in than what the last one did. Uh, But I do have a criticism. Uh, When they get to this scene, they find that both of their rooms are like just trash, right? Now, with Indy's room, I can understand that he didn't see it because he was in with Donovan in, I guess, the living area. But Elsa, her room was trashed and she didn't notice it, but she was in her own bathroom. So how did she not see that her room was trashed, but she went in there, she would have had to see that her room was, that someone had gone in. Anyways, I just thought I'd bring that up. That's a very good point. I have no idea when she trashed them because that looked like making that kind of mess would be very noisy. And those rooms are all three within a very close, uh, quarters of each other and they didn't hear any of it and she was able to sneak around and do the whole thing it's a bit of a stretch to believe that she was the one knocking everything over and he doesn't even suspect her whatsoever right uh yeah that's that's a good criticism i can definitely see that right and once we do make it to brunvald castle uh we kind of get some more lightheartedness with indy's scottish accent and this is something that i've noticed i think think all of the movies have done except really raiders uh, i don't think raiders really had too much humor to it it had some lightheartedness but temple of doom took it to a whole new level with throwing things and literally conking people on the head with that type of noise and right just goofy things and um it was just a very uneven tone with that movie i don't think this movie goes quite as far i do think they reel it back in But nevertheless, it is nice to see a little bit lightheartedness coming off of a movie that was unnecessarily dark. Right. Yeah, this one kind of strikes the middle ground between the two, where it is very silly at many moments, but it does take itself as about as seriously as Raiders does. So yeah, it's like right between the two, where there are silly moments and then there are also serious moments. But it doesn't overdo. I I wouldn't say it overdoes either of them to the extent of of the first and the second. So one of the issues that I just came to me while watching this one, I would have brought it up in Raiders if I would have thought about it, but it was this issue where we're coming back to the Nazis who are once again seeking a Judeo-Christian artifact, and that really just doesn't make sense because the Nazis are going to exterminate the Jews. They hate the Jews, and maybe this is why they are... Maybe this fuels some of their animosity because they can't use their artifacts to rule them. It just seems odd that the Nazis would be seeking a Jewish holy artifact when the Nazis hated the Jews and clearly they hated the Jewish God and the same with the Christian God. It's like they hate Christianity. Hitler thought Christianity was weak and stupid, but yet they think their Christian artifacts hold superior power. That just goes the grain of against logic, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see that criticism, but I think for them, it's more or less just poisoning the minds further of the of the Jews, uh, taking the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to use it if it has something that can be used. Then they'll use it, which that doesn't end up happening. Uh, the Grail, of course, if they can use that, if it has something to do with anything then they'll use it against the jews with they use it in war i think that's what it's kind of going for is more or less just taking the taking more of what i guess making the jews more hopeless in their own minds i think that's what it's going for yeah i can definitely see that it just at first just hit me and i'm like wait a minute right but yeah it's not really about it being a necessarily christian or jewish artifact it's about the power that it holds, and right. power is corruptive to them, so they're not even going to think logically about it. They're just going to think, how can we be as controlling as possible? So that's kind of a nitpick, I would say, but just one that I was like, wait, that's kind of funny that the Nazis hate the Jews, so they want to use Jewish power against them. Okay. 
Right. Yeah. This big theme of power is evident through, I think, all of them. Yeah. I'm, it's been a while since I've seen four, oh, yeah. but I would assume four as well. This thing of this object has a lot of power, uh, whether that be, uh, I guess in all these, it's kind of more supernatural, but they want that kind of power, whoever it may be. And so they will go to great lengths to have it versus somebody who's just like, don't do that. That's a bad idea. So and they want it more for an art, more for a historical con, a more a historical kind of idea. So we get a number of reveals here. We finally get to see Sean Connery's face after 48 minutes. Right. We heard his voice about 10 minutes in, but now we finally see him. And I got to say, I love their team up. I think it really helps make the movie. Oh, yeah. This they are hilarious together. Uh, I don't think you really could have gotten any other two actors to do this kind of a relationship and have it work as well as these two do. I'm surprised they don't do as... M- I don't think I've ever seen them together in anything else, uh, Sean Connery and Harrison Ford, that I've seen at, at least. So I don't know why they haven't been together in anything else more popular, at least that I'm aware of. But yeah, they do. A- they have a really good chemistry here, and it's hilarious. Like, this is what... This- and it's kind of funny because this movie, although it has very silly moments, the moments with... Uh, Sean Connery and Harrison Ford feel quite authentic, but still really funny. Oh yeah, they they're definitely authentic. Uh, they play off each other so well. There's this loving but antagonistic relationship between the two of them. I I can right. definitely just see them being father and son. I don't ever question it or be like, oh really? That's that doesn't make any sense. No, it makes complete sense. So Sean Connery was a perfect casting choice for this, and uh. I can't help but when I think of The Last Crusade, I can't help but just think of those two together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am pretty sure not many people can't go without, who have seen it, can't go without thinking about these two when thinking about Last Crusade just in general. Because these, these two are such an iconic pair uh, that it it almost just warrants that kind of a thought. It, it, they are very hilarious together. And I have to say that the father and son theme that they have is great. Awesome. I really, really, really like the father and son theme when they play it on. It's, it's the main theme during the motorcycle chase, uh, during a couple more moments later on. Uh, I guess it would also be the plane chase scene. It's, it's heavy on those, it's heavily emphasized in those. And it's, really, it's a really good theme, of course. John Williams does a fantastic job, as usual. This is nothing new. Were you surprised by the other two reveals that Schneider was a double agent and Donovan was a traitor? I guess I was more surprised that that, uh, Elza, Dr. Schneider, was a reveal. But I kind of figured from the beginning that Donovan was a bit more nefarious. I didn't really think that he was necessarily a good guy, uh, really in any sense. Dr. Schneider, I guess, was the one that surprised me more. Although I have seen this movie, I knew the twist was coming. But she was the one that surprised me more. And I, I'll kind of explain that a bit later in the movie because I there is a visual that comes in that I want to talk about a bit later when we get to when uh, when Marcus Brody comes back into play. But yeah, that was one thing that did surprise me a little bit. One of my favorite lines and honestly one of my favorite scenes in this movie is when Indy is explaining how the Nazis will never find Marcus Brody. Because Brody's got friends in every town and village from here to Sudan. He speaks a dozen languages, knows every local custom. He'll blend in, disappear. You'll never see him again. With any luck, he's got the grail already. I just love that scene because it's juxtaposed with a very dramatic zoom as Indy gives his little monologue. And then it cuts to Marcus bumbling through the town. You know, doesn't speak a word of the local language and neither does anybody else. And he just becomes it, – it's kind of odd because his character seemed a little more sophisticated than how he ultimately turns out. But uh, yeah. he just becomes this bumbling goofball. But the way um, – I think this movie does a very good job of juxtaposing um, kind of these serious with naive type of scenes. Like I just said, the opening was kind of this naive adventure where he doesn't really understand the gravity of the situation when he's a kid. But then when he grows up – He's back in that same situation, and it's actually much more serious because of the storm and possible death and losing the cross. And uh, this scene is that as well, but it uses humor instead of a dramatic 
it does use dr- drama and humor to kind of create that funny blend. Right. And I I will have to say that my criticism with Marcus Brody is that he's a bit too much of a goofball, like to a point where I'm just like, is he really a professor? <laughs> because he just seems there are moments where he kind of just does things that are kind of idiotic, more or less. Right. And I get that he's try- I get that his character is meant to be the uh, comic relief of this movie, which is fine. Uh, he just seems to be a bit too silly for someone that I would believe as a professor. And exactly. I mean, judging from the character that we've been given in Raiders and in the very beginning, there's this complete switch where he just becomes this kind of goofball who really can't right. handle himself. And when he is captured, that's definitely a callback to uh, Marion getting captured from Raiders. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, at least it makes sense because this is some place he's never. This, I guess, this is something that he's never personally done before. So on one on one side, it's kind of exciting, but on the other side, he doesn't exactly know what to do. So like, it makes sense, but it is just like, uh, it is kind of awkward, I suppose. But yes, uh, it, I do agree. It is kind of funny that they have that callback to Raiders when he gets captured. Like literally, he gets off the boat, walks a few about thirty feet with Sala, and then he's captured again right and it's just it's just funny i am confused why sala comes back though yeah that's a good (laughs) point (laughs) i guess because in the first one he was considered to be the best digger uh in really all of the country and so with this one it's more i guess it's they are it's more or less a callback to raiders uh but he's in it much more it has, he has different roles here than he did in Raiders, whereas uh, in Raiders, he was more of just literally just the digger and kind of a sidekick for a while, whereas this one, he kind of just does his own thing. Yeah. But yeah, I kind of want to know what his real purpose is, because he's there, and he's kind of important for the plot, but not integral. As far as I know, he really does nothing to help them. Uh, maybe during that final battle, he probably does something to save somebody's life. But it was just a little confusing when I I missed it. They're talking about uh, Indy. This is right before they realize, I think, that the rooms were trashed. This is when Indy talks with Brody and says, contact Sala, tell him to get on a train, and we need to go to Alexandretta. I think that's what they called it. And then that part of the plot really doesn't come back until uh, quite a bit into, well, I guess probably the beginning of the third act. I'm not really ready to jump there yet, but I'm just bringing this up. That actually did confuse me because when they jump to the Republic of Haiti, I'm like, what? wait, what? I'm, I'm so confused. And I had to look up where that even was. I was very confused how that factored in. I, then I heard somebody say Alexandretta. I'm like, wait a minute. Indy said that to Marcus. Okay, maybe this is where the grail is. That just felt very disconnected within the plot for me, and I was confused. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, there are... I would say that there are moments where the plot does get a little bit confusing. Um, It's not... I wouldn't even say it's really all that bad. But yeah, there are... That is one of those moments where they bring up something, and they don't really reference it until the very end. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where you're confused on that. So were you confused also when they went, it just says Republic of Haiti, and then they're there trying to woo the president of the place or whatever. And I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, that, I was never too confused okay. by it. I mean, I did think a little bit as to why are we here, but then I eventually figured out, okay, uh, given what they were going for beforehand, I, I, I piece it together. Okay, and I guess this also comes in with... I feel like it takes us a little too long to get there because at this point, the Grail Diary has been stolen and they need to get it back. And I guess I shouldn't even bring that up just quite yet because there's just two brief moments that I did want to mention where we get more of a look into the morality of Indy and his uh, his thought process because Schneider claims Indy and her have the same morals. And he said, I'm sorry you think that way. So that doesn't really seem like an emphatic denial. It seems more like a weak denial to me. And I uh, I did think this could have been an opportunity to strengthen Indy's moral character, but they left it semi-ambiguous. But I think this is, they're trying to show this progression of Indy just 
kind of being this amoral player in the world until he eventually has skin in the game, which is his dad. Uh, do you right. see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just more of a metaphorical representation, Donovan more or less is on the truth side, but on the very far truth side, so that way he is one that wants to poison it. Elsa or Dr. Schneider is on the fact side. She's with Indiana Jones, but her being uh, kind of a seductress kind of, but also more or less, I guess she's a, she's a double agent. So she is also in her heart and her real intent is not necessarily what Indy's is. So Indy is, as his father says, uh, you believe the same things that she does. But if, and if he was to go down that route, with Elsa, then he too would become corrupt, and he would. So you have two of these different players on opposite sides that are leading Indy and, Indy and maybe even his dad in those two different ways. I just wanted to bring that up as well. Yeah, and that's that's definitely strengthened when he slaps him for blasphemy. I liked that yeah. scene. Yeah. And he says, uh, the quest for the grail isn't about archaeology. It's a race against evil. And that's pretty on the nose, but that's still this proper, uh, even a Christian worldview where it's not just about, you're not just this amoral, apathetic player in this race. He's like, this is really serious what's going on. And I think the dad is surprised at how uncaring Indy is about it. And I do like the father brings moral clarity back to his son seems to be ambiguous about it and Indy doesn't care of the sacred only finding it and preserving it for really no other higher purpose other than just to preserve it which is kind of uh, very limited in its own way if that makes sense because eventually it's just going to rot and it's going to be nothing and I do like the father brings back in that higher purpose he, he says right. the Nazis uh, the armies of darkness will march across the earth in, uh, if we don't take this more seriously. Right. And it, it's interesting, too, but this is also kind of really subtle, but they do. there are a couple of lines where it hints to this, uh, especially there towards the end. It, the, the movie does kind of ask this question and moves Indy towards this direction of him maybe even becoming a Christian. We don't it's very, very subtle. And there is one line where he, his father asks him, are you going to believe in this or not? You know, are you going to, like, are you going to try and save this or are you just trying to preserve it? Uh, we do kind of get that kind of a, uh, kind of a representation. Once again, this is very subtle. We don't really get a clear answer on it, but it is a question that's something that is brought up in the movie from his, mostly his dad. Yes, that's a very good point as well. And... Yeah, there is a little more towards that. And I'm, yeah, I've got some stuff to say because I think we we're going to have a good discussion with that as well. But yeah. I really want to know your thoughts about this detour to Berlin and this necessity for finding the Grail Diary. Because then at this point, I feel like the movie becomes more so uh, not really finding the Grail, but finding the Grail Diary. Right. So I was seeing, given that I was... After, I guess, the second viewing, I was seeing it more as a metaphor, seeing more of the metaphors and the allegories that were here. Uh, but I kind of saw the diary as more of a representation of the Bible. I, Of course, it's not a perfect, uh, it's not a perfect match, but I found it as more of just a metaphor. In a, metaf in a metaphorical sense, it is considered to be more uh, the Bible. It's pointing them towards the truth, which is... Uh, the Grail, which is eternal life. So, but, but that that aside, uh, I can see why that they took this time to. They need to get this Grail diary. And at one point, uh, I guess it was right after the motorcycle chase. Uh, he says that we need to go to Berlin because I need to get my diary back. You don't understand how important the diary is to me. I don't remember everything that I wrote down in it. I wrote it out for a reason, you know, and that's why they went back. So I, it, in a metaphorical sense, it makes a lot of sense to me that they would take time out of the movie to retrieve the diary uh, because of how important it is, not just in a metaphorical sense, but also to the story. Right. I mean... Kind of makes me think of the scripture, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the only way they can figure out the path. Right. That's my connection with, with what you were saying. 
But right. uh, I was kind of having an issue with this, though, because the mystery to the three challenges has already been figured out by Indy's father. I think it would have been more perilous and more exciting if they had to forego the diary and Indy had to figure it out himself. Yeah, I I, that, I can see why that would make it a bit more exciting, a bit quicker to get to the ending. And, uh, but yeah. Well, and we know that Indy's father somehow figured out the three challenges without ever seeing the three challenges. So we know Indy could have done that as well. And he still does figure them out in a way, but he has this kind of meta knowledge going into it, if that makes sense. Right. Well, I I do kind of want to take a step back real quick because we probably should talk about this motorcycle chase scene. Okay. Because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> and this is one of the moments when uh the when the father and son theme really plays a role because uh I remember I watched this scene. I think it may have been a Best Buy. They were they were showing the movie on some on some TV. I remember specifically seeing this one scene that was playing and I was like what is this movie? And my dad told me that about it. Uh, but I think that the scene is freaking awesome. And I really, really enjoy it because it is just so fast. And it is, of course, only something that Spielberg could have pulled off. Yeah, this motorcycle chase does have that excitement and energy on the level of the truck chase scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where uh, lots of crazy things are happening. People are getting thrown out of vehicles and... Uh, beat up i really like it it's probably my favorite chase because we get so much action here in just a bit mm -hmm. like pretty much nothing but action and yeah this is like this is a great escape from the castle i was uh, really pleased with this scene yeah and even the castle uh, this is kind of the thing with this movie if even if the scene, because even if the scene is really like the setting is eh in this movie, the banter between the two characters is always hilarious because we get the scene in the castle where they're tied up in the chair and they have to find their way around and try and escape. And I, the banter between the two is just hysterical because you get the scene when they're uh, when they're tied up and the fire has started because of Andy's dad and he's like, "Dad," and his Sean is like, "What, Dad? What, Dad?" Get go to the fire, crawl to the fireplace. It's just always very, very funny in this movie. Yeah, I do like that. Um, almost like this, uh, the series does a good job of this kind of Rube Goldberg type of events where one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which they have to deal with the consequences of that, and uh, it gets so out of control that their only way of escape is to you do something really crazy and right. um, other unexpected twists play in along the way, like him just rolling backwards down the staircase. <laughs> Dad's right. like, where'd you go? Um, yeah, this was definitely the right choice because we see them run out and there's kind of like a lake and they made the right choice of not jumping in boats and doing a high speed boat chase. Cause I don't think that would have worked at all. That's James Bond stuff, which doesn't work in uh, right. the motorcycle chase with the sidecar was really cool. We hadn't seen that before. Right. And we already had a boat chase. Right. As well. So, yeah, that is yeah. true. We did already have the boat chase. A uh, second boat chase would have been a very bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And then a third boat chase. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I, I am glad this, Berlin scene doesn't last very long because I was worried. I was like, oh no, this is going to be a very long detour. But it wasn't, mm -hmm. so I was glad for that. And there is a very important scene where Indy tells Schneider, you betrayed everything the Grail stands for. And I think that's the moral clarity we needed in our hero, where he does make a definitive statement, whereas Schneider was like, you know, you and I are the same. And he said, well, I'm sorry you think that. Well, that's not a very I, great. Yeah, I can really root for you, Indy, with that moral clarity you're exuding. But here is mm -hmm. where he does face her. And uh, I think he really sees that. And possibly it's being in the heart of Berlin where he sees uh, how horrible it all is coming face to face with Hitler. Uh, that was kind of funny. And yeah, and like he signs on some random page in the back of the book, has no idea 
what he's signing. And he doesn't use, uh, as far as I could tell, he wasn't even using German characters. It was English and in print, not in cursive at right. all. I was like, what? Interesting. It, it, it's funny, but it's uh, it's not too bad. Right. Right. Well, now, after this scene is the blimp scene. Yes. And, well, I guess we'll save just for a little bit before we get to the plane scene, but... This is kind of it is kind of funny this joke here where he throws the officer overboard, yeah. uh, and because he wants to well the first the Nazi officer comes in and he's asking for tickets or whatever or no it's the concierge he's like coming by and he's gathering tickets and so Indy takes his clothes right and then he throws the Nazi officer overboard and everyone looks at him and he's like didn't have his ticket everyone of course rustles in their bags and grabs their tickets and throwing them at, like holding it toward his face I just thought that was very funny it was funny. Um... Yeah, I, all of the Germans knew English what ticket meant. I think it was probably mostly just the fear of yeah. the situation. But I do think this is a fairly well done scene here on the blimp. It kind of gives you a moment of reprieve before mm-hmm. the third act begins, I guess you could say. This is kind of that transition into that. I did already express my grievance with, I just felt like, we had this realistic father and son dynamic where the son always felt less important and the father felt he was teaching the son self-reliance. But unfortunately I feel like this scene of character building fizzles out when Indy can't think of anything to have a heart to heart with his father and your explanation for it, I think is a good explanation, but I do feel like they could have driven that point home a little better that Indy was like, well, maybe you're right. Maybe I was just kind of being a baby about all of this, and you really did teach me a lot of lessons, and it was just an unnecessary grudge. I just felt like him saying, like, well, I don't know. And then he's like, well, what are you blabbing on about then? Let's get back to the grail. I I just felt like they could have been handled that better. Yeah, and I, I can see that. I can definitely see that. But also one pretty fun fact about the scene, there when they were filming it, it was really, really hot. Mm. And so... Indiana Jones, I guess Harrison Ford and Sean Connery took off their pants Ooh. because it was just this hot as they were filming the scene. So, of course, everything is shot from the waist up, so you wouldn't know. But just a little fun fact. That is funny. That That's, <laughs> that's hilarious they would do that. So, yeah. okay, here is where I feel like the movie gets uh, a little too off track here because I already said I felt like going to find the Grail Diary was uh, I feel like they didn't really need to do that. And then I really feel like the plane sequence where they have to escape in the plane and then they have to escape from ground on the plane and then they come and have this big, you know, Armageddon-style battle on the ground in this valley with the brothers of the cruciform sword, with the Nazis, and with Jones. It's a really long scene. And I just feel like at this point, the movie is more about string together action sequences and finding MacGuffins than actually finding the grail and getting to the grail. Or even just right. getting close to it is taking forever. And I think it would have been a better choice when they set up the first act of these three brothers. Okay. So clearly we know the third brother is the one guarding the grail because he was never seen again. And then the first brother is in a sarcophagus. Well, the second act should have featured the second brother. I know they said he died of old age, but I think that would have given us more tie with the first act and more of a logical sequence in the story. Finding these three brothers to get to the three clues, because the first brother in the crypt held the first clue, but then it's just kind of this meandering jumble of action sequences until you get to the third one. Right. And uh, I would even say that the action scene that follows after the blimp turns around is the really the only action scene in this movie that doesn't hold up very well. And it really doesn't hold up very well. You can see the matting around, the black outline around Indiana Jones and his dad in the plane at some points. Uh, you can see the basically the green screen that they use on some different, uh, some of the showing like the interior shots of the German planes. It doesn't hold up very well. And so, I, yeah, I would absolutely agree with you. This this scene, not just because it looks doesn't look very good for now, but then it continuing on and on and on, uh, it just kind of feels like almost a needless action scene. Like, we probably didn't completely need this, 
Uh, I mean, I don't know why. I guess maybe there's some logical reason why they'd have a biplane hanging hanging underneath the blimp. But yeah, I agree. This is like it's almost it's pretty needless. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. It is a lot of fun. But I agree. We're kind of at this point. We're kind of moving away. This is what I think this is probably one of the scenes where I felt like the action wasn't necessarily needed and there wasn't too much weight to it. Whereas the previous action scenes, I felt like there was a reason for them to be there. This one, it just kind of feels like, well, we need to get them off the, on the ground somehow. And so they did. It just, it didn't, like, I agree with you on this one. It didn't fit completely with everything else. Yeah. And it's not like I really minded it because it is well done aside from the very dated, obvious visual effects. But I guess my biggest issue is because I, I do think the plane scene is very exciting. It's very reminiscent of North by Northwest, how yes. uh, the plane is shooting at them, but it is got more of a updated twist of the plane crashing through the tunnel, which did look pretty good to me. But it's just when they're fighting in the desert. That's a long sequence and longer than any action sequence in Raiders, I felt. Or Right. You know. Yep. I think the tank scene was the one that Spielberg wanted to use to top the chase scene from from Raiders. Mm. I don't think it topped it because either. Raiders. I, I mean, I at least they both have weight to it. This one at least has some weight to it because his dad and his dad and Marcus Brody are both in the tank, yeah. uh, the big tank. So there is reason for Indy to I want to come after it and have this entire scene that that does occur. But, yeah, it does kind of go on for a long time. The music is good, though. I like the music here. Uh, but, yeah, it does kind of go overly long. I would say it overstays its welcome than probably what it should have. I was getting Rambo 3 flashbacks where they had that I can final see that. big battle in the desert just like this. I can see that. Def- At least it's better than Rambo 3. Yes. I can definitely see that. Um, I, there is a very interesting point that might be a reference to scripture is when right before they, uh, murder Kazim, he says the cup of life, the cup of life holds everlasting damnation. And especially mostly that's pointed towards Donovan. And I was reminded of first Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29, that says, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Clearly, I think that's a direct callback to that verse. And that's the foreshadowing that we're getting is you have to uh, drink of the cup with the right spirit. If it's for selfish motives, then you're drinking judgment on yourself. And also in 1 Corinthians 8, I believe, there is recorded instances of people, you know, drinking and taking of the bread and they're not in the right spirit. And it doesn't, I don't know if it goes too deep into those reasons, but clearly they're in a Donovan-esque mindset and it does actually kill them. Right. And there is also a line that we hear, actually it's the last line we hear from Kazim before he walks off after the boat scene and he asks Indy, are you trying to find the grail for God? Or are you trying to find the grail for yourself? Yeah, that was a great part. Yeah, once again, tying to exactly what you were saying. But yeah, that is, this is a real danger at this point. Is Indy going to turn into something like Donovan where he's more, not necessarily finding it for uh, evil means like Donovan is, but is he going to take it more, is he going to do it just because he feels as if he needs to, not because that's the right thing to do? Is it he's is he doing it for more selfish reason selfish reasons or is he doing it for something some for a good intention? And it does call back to that as well uh, here in the next scene when Indy is asked of when somebody asked Indy it's time to ask yourself what you believe because right. in the first act Indy seems to say any belief aside from tangible artifacts of history is merely superstition and it's all based upon legend it's kind of pointless to put your faith in anything or your belief in anything higher than what you can touch and this is when he's exactly faced with this dilemma and uh, i gotta say i was shocked when his dad was shot that was a twist i didn't remember yeah that's right i do remember this scene this is the one of the few things that i remembered 
as a kid when I watched this. But yes, I did. I did remember this when uh, Henry Jones is shot, and that almost forces Indy to uh, go in and take on the trials. And I gotta say, have you seen the pacifier? No, I know of it, but I haven't seen it. Okay, sorry guys, I'm going to spoil the end of the pacifier for you. Oh, great. So <laughs> click your 15 second ahead button or, <laughs> if you don't want to hear it. To be fair, it's not really a movie I've I've, I've never really ever looked into watching and spending time on. So. It, I'll, I'll admit it's a pretty fun family movie, but I got to say the end of the pacifier directly ripped off the end of this. Interesting. Directly. Because in the end of the pacifier, Vin Diesel, uh, the lady is has a gun to her head, just like his dad has been shot. It's you know it's a little lower stakes because it's meant for the family, but right. he has these different clues that he's heard of, and he has to use these clues in order to get to the end of the room, which contains the microchip or whatever instead of the grail and that's exactly what indy does he has to think about it and then he has to duck or he has to go the other way this is directly ripped off in the end of the pacifier interesting wow <laughs> well i, I mean i guess i've seen pieces of that movie but i haven't seen it all the way through so watch it it's a recommend maybe i will <laughs> <laughs> no i'm being serious it's it's a pretty fun movie for the family but yep. Yep. Uh, this is pretty fun here. I am kind of getting some Goonies vibes off of the very end where they're getting close to whatever it's called, Willie's Treasure. And uh, Jehovah in Latin begins with an I. And that, that makes me think of the piano scene where another Spielberg film, for those of you who don't know, Goonies is Spielberg. But they have to remember the right keys for this song, and they play it. And if they do it wrong, then the floor breaks apart, just like the floor breaks apart in this. But I think these challenges are pretty effective. I think they're I, – I would say my favorite is probably the second one. Um, it's the most intellectual. The first one anybody would know just duck after watching people's mm -hmm. heads get cut off twice. And the third uh, – I got to say I was impressed with the visual effect of the third one yeah and once again bringing in this theme of just kind of taking a leap of faith indy at one point literally has to take a leap uh... of faith <laughs> um when it comes to that bridge that's like invisible uh i did read that industrial light and magic had to do some visual trickery to make it look like that it was uh, well done. yeah it is really well done i think there's only one moment and i could be very wrong about this but it looked like i could tell that indy was on a green screen when he's walking across this bridge but that aside, these three challenges are literally based in faith uh, that you ha that you can not necessarily see ahead, but that you that these challenges, what they are implying that you're supposed to do, are actually going to follow through with that. And at one moment, when he has when the bridge is there, the invisible bridge, more or less, he literally has to take a leap of faith. Yeah, and he also has to, you know, take a leap of faith that. The grail he chose won't kill his dad. Right. Right. Exactly. So, so I do yeah. really like this ending scene with the knight. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. This knight has been guarding it this whole time. But I do like there is this fourth challenge, which is what I was hoping the third challenges would kind of be more of fig him figuring it out and him not having any too much knowledge of it. But I, I guess I understand him having knowledge of the three challenges is a way to communicate that to the viewer. So we're not totally in the dark about it. But the fourth one is a good one where he has lots of choices. And the choice of what he picks um, will reveal the character of the person, but you can also tell Indy does use his archaeology um, intuition, you could say, to say, okay, that's the one a first century Jewish carpenter would drink from, not the one that Donovan says, this is the cup of King of Kings. Right, right. And it's, it's funny because uh, Donovan goes for what looks like the most the prettiest of chalices that are there. He goes for the one that's outwardly, hey, this, I am more or less, I am the king, you know, then the one that looks like you would, that one that looks like a king would drink out of. And then he 
drinks from it and i mean it's a pretty impressive visual i wonder if i was wondering if they actually used some cgi when they were aging his face i couldn't find any counsel they did or didn't but of course it comes to bring out his true character it is the wrong chalice it's the wrong rail that he drank from and he ends up dying just right there and then indy of course uses his intellect and also reason to deduct that, oh, it would be just the one that's the most ordinary. It's the one that's kind of among all these really beautiful chalices and beautiful grails. It's the one that what a carpenter would drink out of. And turns out it's the correct one. That's very, very interesting. They That this is, of course, goes this has in with everything that the movie's been building up to at this point. But yeah. Yeah, the effect for Donovan was very well done. It was more well done. You can tell they've advanced since Raiders on those very creepy ending effects. It's a very similar to what happens to the people in the end of Raiders, but I don't feel like it's as satisfying as what happens with Raiders because I feel right. this is just passed over too quickly. I feel like honestly Donovan was a weak pro- weak antagonist to begin with. He's not given a whole lot of screen time and his motivations are fairly simple, but I just don't get that uh he's just this big nemesis that Indy has to go against and they just kind of dispatch with him a little too quickly I feel in order for us to get that vindication like yes, this is how evil is rewarded. It seems to be more about the effects than about the actual lesson, if that makes sense. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because this movie does take a very logical approach, uh, as much as it can at least, to how it presents its heroes and villains. So Donovan, even though, even if he didn't have, even if he wasn't a part of the Nazi regime, his intentions are what is what the movie is basing it off of. So he, the whole movie has been building up to this point when he is following this for a more selfish and evil intent of taking the grail but his way of going about it is also very logical very akin to indiana jones and his father and the same with dr schneider who's just constantly just going back and forth between the two the two sides so i didn't find that necessarily to be a criticism on my end but i do agree with you this i guess this entire ending in general is kind of underwhelming especially when you compare it to Raiders of the Lost Ark, because nothing can really compare to the ending of Raiders because it built up to that ending very, very well. This one, it has a, a similar end to Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I don't think it, that it it sticks with me nearly as much as Raiders does. I will also say that I feel like almost Donovan isn't the main adversary and it's possible that you could read Schneider as the adversary because she is this character who has allied herself with the Nazis, but she has justified it. And uh, just her death sequence where she is striving for the grail, but falls into that mist that frightened me when I saw this, when I, it was on TV one time and I saw that and I found that to just be so frightening. She just falls into this, abyss and we don't right. really knows what happened to her but there's just something about that that is more unnerving uh just i don't know falling into the earth uh i think that's telegraphed a little uh it kind of conveys something a little more than just the rapid cgi aging right yeah and with her and then with indy a second like literally after a second yeah. later after she falls it's this question of are they going to succumb to what they what their human selves want because this is the chalice this is the grail that holds literally eternal life and are they going to succumb to that and agree with that and try and grab for it or are they just going to you know let it go and let it be where it needs to stay and have it and there are some things in life that indy comes to learn here that they can't necessarily put in a museum this is one of those the chalice the grail literally can't leave this temple it's meant to stay there and it's meant to be buried and then it is it's, it's gone after this they don't they can't just go out back and find it so i do really enjoy this scene that even indy is drawn to what this grail has to offer but he has to give it up in order to survive himself i like that i do think it is satisfying where indy can't always get what he wants but he right. realizes what he wants is his dad and not just this object that he uh, 
to me, the object that he would want, he would want it for shallow reasons, but um, desiring his dad because he risked so much just to save him and they rekindled their relationship. That's a very satisfying payoff, I think. Right. And I, and I like that Elsa Schneider and Indy have kind of two different motivations, but they're also somewhat the same because Schneider is kind of the same as Donovan, where she wants to take it for her own reasons and become very powerful. Whereas Indy just wants to grab it, not necessarily for, I guess, not necessarily for uh, selfish reasons, but to more or less preserve it, just as has always been talked about in this movie. He wants to preserve that grail for historical reasons. Once again, he can't, he can't just do that. He, this is something that is so beyond what he is, I guess, what he would consider to be fact. The moves into truth that he shouldn't be putting it and containing it somewhere like in a museum. So yeah, he does learn that lesson that not everything is factual. There are some things where you kind of just have to, uh, you kind of have to run by faith and you have to believe that whatever's going to happen is whatever's going to happen. I I do also want to point out that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is basically the same plot as this really? movie. Yeah. Uh, the Sorcerer's Stone will give you like everlasting life or something or the elixir of life. I don't remember. And Voldemort wants it. And uh, Harry also is tempted to grab it. But they both end in very similar ways. And I, I just, that just dawned on me. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone has the same plot. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Indiana Jones, but... They're they're both still kind of different, but kind of drawing from that same mythology and having very similar character and character motivations and conclusions. So, right. interesting compare. Indeed. Okay. So I, it's, I, I've seen most of the Sorcerer's Stone, but not all the way through. That's a pretty long movie anyways. The second one's even longer. That's right, it is. <laughs> okay, I do want to I do want to bring something up here. Because okay. once they do leave the temple, uh, they're all kind of asking each other, what did you find in there? Hence, what did you learn from all of this? And Indy's dad only gives one word, illumination. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think that means? Hmm. I'll have to think about it a little bit. I personally felt that was too ambiguous. Okay. I felt that we needed a bit more because the the visual uh, concrete image of Indy almost getting the grail and almost getting his dad was a great representation of how Indy is choosing truth over facts or artifacts instead of... Uh, his his dad I, I thought that was really well done and played out visually there and a nice uh, redemption for the indiana jones character but I, i'm trying to see the point in them even the, the the screenwriters even putting this in for his dad if they're going to make it very vague because we know right. his dad has been saying earlier on believe son you have to believe and this is the battle against good and evil so I'm trying to understand what he is possibly what what illumination did he receive? The movie doesn't really tell us, and I'm kind of disappointed by that. So I would say that for him, I think it just more or less goes to show that whatever he was searching for his entire life is true, and so for him, it's illuminating to know that this thing that he's been searching for is in fact a real thing. Uh, to more or less go along with that, I'm going to present you what I would, said I would present to the beginning of this podcast, but I would wait uh, because I think now is a good time. I think that Indiana Jones and Marcus Brody and Henry Jones are a representation of the Trinity because you have, of course, Henry Jones is the father and then Indiana Jones is the son, and then you have Marcus Brody, who ends up being the Holy Spirit, and he's like the connection between the two, because he said in one moment in the movie that I watched you two go together, and then I watched you two go apart. And so, of course, and he has his own side plot to get back together. And so I see this as, especially in this ending, I think it's a bit more poignant, a bit more in your face, 
than before, uh, that these three characters are more or less the a representation of the Trinity. And then you get to see two, at least two of them, Henry, jo- Henry and Indiana Jones, grow as two characters as the movie moves along. Uh, I, it's not necessarily what the movie is going for as an overall sense. It's more of just a representation of that idea. So I going along with him saying that it's illuminating and Henry Jones being representative, maybe even of God, I think that that for me just kind of makes a lot of sense in my mind because he is, uh, for him, it was confirmation that my beliefs are real. They exist. And this is what I've been searching for my whole life kind of a thing. That's what I was seeing. Yeah, that's a really interesting take on pos- the possible symbolism of the characters. And possibly even more of that illumination could be the strength of their bond, father and son bond, and right. how Indy is still very much like his father. And thankfully that is reaffirmed. And uh, I do really like what you had to say about his beliefs being affirmed because we have seen ever since Indy was a kid, the father has been pretty much obsessed with grail lore. He's drawing a picture of a crusader um, from this grail books. And he's saying, uh, God, please let this be uh, pleasing to you. And uh, I think we do see that fulfilled there in the end. So, yeah, I do think you what you said did shed more. It was illuminating to right. my final uh, kind of take on that ending scene there. But in true Indiana Jones fashion, we get a pretty fun ending. Uh, I, okay, I really do like that they brought up the dog. The naming of the dogs. That was very funny. That, I do have to admit. <laughs> yes, that was so clever because listeners, for those of you who haven't heard the other two podcasts, characters' names are always, for the most part, derived from their the writers, directors, creators, real life pets. Right. So Indiana is coming from oh I can't remember now. It's I think it's Lucas's alaskan type dog yeah and that's so funny because the dad says henry jones jr and he said we named the dog indiana and indy's like i liked indiana better and uh that's just a pretty neat moment between the father and son it's very funny and i think it's the right uh right tone to end they thought they were ending the whole series at the time and yeah yeah, I, I do like the right off into the sunset, and Spielberg was saying, I'm telegraphing that as I'm closing the curtains on the series. Right, until a few years later. But that's next week. Uh, I will have to say my only criticism is that it kind of just ends abruptly. Like, once they leave the palace, once they leave, the, I guess that, uh, I, I, get, what's, I guess, what's the good name? The I struggled with figuring out a name for it. Yeah, because it's not necessarily a castle, it's not necessarily a palace, it's not necessarily a tomb, not really catacombs, whatever it is, the <laughs> the place that holds the grail, uh, when they leave that place, that's the end. The, once they walk out, they hop on the horses, and then the mood just cuts off, and that's it. I would have liked a bit more resolution with the story, uh, but they do leave it off on a good note, regardless. So yeah, they're running off to the sunset, and that this is what solidified my idea of the Trinity being represented here with these three characters is when they're running off into the sunset, kind of westerny too as well. And uh, of course, Sala rides off with them. Yep. Don't know why he was there. Didn't do anything for him. Pretty much, he got them horses. There was a yeah. pretty funny line though because Sala grabs camels. Yeah. And then Indiana Jones is riding by, and he goes, "Sala, I said five horses. Can you count?" This is funny. Yeah, and he, he's like, no camels. And then Sala, of course, brings a couple camels. Yeah. And he said, I told you not to bring camels. Yeah. Very funny. So, Alan, what is your rating and recommendation for Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? I mean, I think this, what I said earlier of the tones kind of being, this one kind of being in the middle between Raiders and Temple of Doom, I think that this is exactly where this movie belongs. This is a really fun movie to watch, but also one that isn't like Temple of Doom where it's fun, 
but it's also rather weak in, in an overall sense. This one is very fun, but also very strong. But I don't think that it's as good as Raiders, but I can see why some people would consider it better than Raiders. I do have some criticisms, as I've stated before. Uh, the plane scene is kind of just dragging on, doesn't look as great as it used to. Uh, this ending kind of just ends abruptly out of nowhere. But I can't deny the fact that I would go definitely go back and watch it again. And now I'm going to have to buy at least the trilogy uh, on Blu-ray eventually, once it hopefully goes down in price. This is just a great movie. It's, it has some really interesting imagery uh, that you don't necessarily see in mainstream movies as much anymore. So, yeah, really, really fun. A great score, as usual, sometimes better. But I would say that the Grail theme is not as good as the uh, Ark of the Covenant theme. That one is still by far my favorite. But the Father and Son theme is also a ton of fun as well. Uh, Hunt, this is something that uh, John Williams is never... This is something that John Williams is also very well known for and something that I really, really enjoy. So overall, really fun, uh, really interesting, and I would really, I would would highly recommend it. I'll give it this a 9 out of 10, a high recommend. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is a vast improvement over its schizophrenic slash paganist predecessor. This third installment features great new and returning characters, a riveting plot of recovering another Judeo-Christian artifact, and great albeit too much and too long of action. And that last point is where my trouble with the movie comes in. At a certain point, the search for the grail stalls, and the movie becomes nothing but action sequence after action sequence. A lot of the action could have been trimmed down, or we could have had more plot points of finding the grail, instead of a basically finding its whereabouts in the end of the first act, but not getting to it till the third act, because the second act was nothing but recovering the grail diary and action sequences. In Raiders, the first act was introducing our characters and uncovering clues, and the second act was actually getting the Ark, and then the third act was stopping the bad guys who got the Ark back. And that's exactly why Raiders is much better than this one. It has more of a focused direction on unraveling the mystery instead of putting the mystery in the back seat while the characters fight each other for almost the whole movie. I am very glad this one features a positive Christian worldview of good triumphing over evil only by putting aside selfish desires. Indy does have a nice character arc where he's treasure hunting just because it brings him pleasure, but when it comes to his family and dealing with sacred objects, preserving them is far more important. The chemistry bef between Ford and Connery is really well done and believable. Their character development comes mostly in their interactions and not in their dialogue, which is okay, but I believe the writers could have strengthened their bond better instead of coming up with just instead of coming up short and just redirecting to the plot. This is also an issue with uh, characters coming to revelations about how their beliefs have changed over the course of the story. Indy's is better than his father's watery, ambiguous new outlook on life, but Alan has helped me change my mind on that, so I'm kind of changing a bit of this. This was written a few days ago. Um, but I do feel like there should have been um, more of a solid... Uh, these character more of a solid character conclusions with the two of these. So, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is a good movie, albeit one with significant flaws. I'm giving it a seven out of ten with a mild recommend. I will say this much: I guess I forgot to mention this in my overall. I guess in my final thoughts, but that's okay. Uh, I I kind of wrote them out the three that we've seen so far. In what how I categorize them, and I would say that the first is the most adventurous, the second is the most unique, and the third is the most personal. Yeah, that's that's a definitely a good way of looking at it, and I would agree with that. Yeah, the first one is definitely the most adventurous. The second one is unique to the point of almost craziness. Where it just strays off and it's too unique and represents certain people in a bad light and <laughs> it's right. just too wild. But uh, I was kind of hoping they would have followed more of the formula of the first one because in the third act of the second one, that's too much action like we talked about. It was really nonstop right. and I felt like they kind of repeated themselves here. Don't get me wrong, they did way better 
uh, with this one. And I'll, I mean, I'm not going to say each action scene in two and three is not exciting, but um, I do think they could have balanced it a little better by um, kind of maintaining some more findings within the second act. But don't get me wrong, this is a vast improvement over two. Yes. I would say, I guess one thing we differ, that we didn't mention in this one, up until now, I guess, is the sets. Because we mentioned it in one and two, and we said that two had probably, at times, had better sets than the first one yeah. did. And I feel like three has really good locations, but when it comes to set boating, I think that's probably where it lacks the most of the other two. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. It's kind of disappointing because I love the sets in Spielberg movies. Yeah. It gives you such a sense of just kind of mystery and the magic of watching this cinematic movie where you know it's not real but it's just such a joy to be in that kind of fantasy world uh and we really didn't get that with this one it's definitely more realistic the castle feels very right. real um i guess the library and the crypt are sets but i don't think they're they don't have the same air as the other ones and then the set in the very end of the we have no idea what to call it i struggled i inserted different words in my plot summary and i kept deleting them I'm like well that's not right but right. yeah that set was just kind of like oh okay um yeah that one is the best one i think that really is the only set that we ever see everything else from to my knowledge is all shot on location yeah. i know that the library scene was shot on location they had it rented out for only a certain amount of time i'm wouldn't doubt that the boat scene was shot in venice uh, right. I mean, it looks like everything out here is shot, like you were just saying, is more realistic. It's shot on location, but at the same time, we don't get those immaculate sets that we had in one and two, which were famously known for those reasons. They were really, really well done. And here we, really, the only one that is really a set per se is the very is a finale. Well, Alan, thank you for joining me on this review, our second to last installment in the retrospective series. I'm very excited to talk about the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I watched it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think I mentioned about a year and a half or so ago in the last podcast. So I'm interested to come back and rewatch it uh, again. This is the longest one, right? Probably. Okay. Uh, this That'd be fun. The Last Crusade, the other ones... One and two came close to two hours. This one broke two hours, and I know four does break two hours as well. Yeah, okay. Well, that'll be an interesting conversation to We're have. We're going to have a lot of fun with the, with the next one. So you definitely don't want to miss us review uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull because I have a lot of thoughts. If you thought I had a lot of thoughts on this one, maybe even more thoughts than the other two, um... I wasn't trying to be critical with this one at all, but those were just definite things that I noticed that I felt like I had to bring up. Well, uh, we're going to have fun with the fourth one then, so I'm really looking forward to that. So once again, thank you for joining me, Alan, and thank you listeners for joining us. I want you to leave your comments and let us know what your thoughts on The Last Crusade is. Where does it rank for you? in the spectrum because i know people have very different opinions on the rankings of the indiana jones movies so i'm very intrigued to see what you all think as well make sure to subscribe give us a five star rating if you feel so inclined on itunes that really does help the podcast get noticed and if you enjoyed this then share it with your friends because we love talking about movies and we love talking about them with you so we hope to see some uh, new listeners here uh, that we can have fun discussing movies with. And I'm having a really fun time with this series. I'm learning a lot about it, learning what I like, what I don't like. And uh, I really enjoy that aspect of the retrospective series. And we have a bunch of great uh, reviews coming up. I've seen like four theatrical movies, so YouTube videos are forthcoming. Those take a bit to create graphics and edit, but trust me, you're going to have... Uh, plenty of content coming <laughs> within the week. Uh, I've and movie passes being movie pass. So. Yes. Although I hear that they've seen that they've somewhat rectified somewhat the issue of no movie sh show times being in any theaters. So yes, that's a good. That's thing. true. Uh, I'm looking forward to giving you my review of the Meg. 
that oh, that, yes. that was a fun one to say the least <laughs> But, uh, and apparently I just saw Mission Impossible also. It is now the 165th greatest film of all time. It, everybody loves it. Uh, yep, it's huge. Apparently it's one of the greatest films ever. Uh, we'll see, though. That's what I've heard. It, I've heard it's either one or two things. Either it's one of the greatest action movies ever made or it's just okay. Those are the only two criticisms, criticisms I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet. But those are the only two things I've heard. You'll have to listen to my review to see what I think. But I got to say, there is a sequence that really rips off the Dark Knight. And okay. it's like, wait a I'll minute. I'll be excited to see That's, that. Okay. Even down to, I'm not even going to say it. You're going to have to watch the review. <laughs> going to have to watch the review because once I say it, you're going to be like, oh, wait a minute. That's, yep, that's from the Dark Knight. Anyways, thank you, listeners. Once again, uh, make sure to uh, subscribe through your favorite social media avenue. Just type in Silver Screen Guide. Pretty easy to find. And you can also subscribe on our website with your email. So you can have uh, weekly deliveries to your inbox of everything that we publish so that you miss nothing. I also want to mention that we do have a Patreon page where you can get great exclusive content, bonus podcasts, movie commentaries. Have you ever wondered our direct thoughts, not just kind of the summary of our thoughts when we do these retrospectives, but kind of a play-by-play of our thoughts while watching the movies and even more things that stick out to us. Well, you can get all of that for a very reasonable price over at our Patreon page. For just a few dollars, uh, skip going to Starbucks today and you'll get a bunch of great content that is yours forever instead of a drink that tastes good and then it's gone. So, yeah, exactly. So go ahead and head on over to our Patreon page. Like I said, go to Patreon, just type in Silver Screen Guide, very easy to find, and we will, of course, leave the links in the description below just to make everything easier for you as well. Once again, thank you. I'm very excited to come back for Crystal Skull very soon, and we will catch you next time, listeners. That awkward moment when Little Mermaid beats Indiana Jones at the Academy Awards. See, this is something that I've kind of noticed. If it's a Disney movie, like one of the more popular ones, like either Pixar or uh, one of the, as they were calling it, the Disney Renaissance uh, about Mm -hmm. this time, typically they're going to win whatever Oscar Oscar nomination they get for that because... uh, I don't know why, but that's just how it is. To, that's how, I guess how it's always been.